Brilliant stuff. Okay, so it's Father's Day, so I have the great privilege of speaking about fathers, mainly because um, this was coming up, and I just switched it around to make sure it fitted the, uh, the exact topic of today. Uh, the supernatural adoption was on our list. Uh, we have another topic coming up next, next Sunday, and I've swapped them for this exact reason. So there's that beautiful picture of a father with a son or a daughter, and um, just showing that absolute adoration and love towards a child. Now, if you've just had a child and you're a half-decent person, you do look at your child in that way, don't you? You just think, this is unbelievable. I get to love this thing and grow it and care for it, protect it. And, uh, and, and you immediately, uh, you're just overwhelmed with the responsibility sometimes. And it's actually my job to be their parent. And it, and it can be quite a big deal. Um, and I think, you know, we sometimes, you know, as Christians, we read all this stuff and we think, oh, God calls himself a father and... Um, you know, maybe it's just his name or something, because I don't know if I can really picture God looking at me like that. But the promise of Scripture is that he did look like that. He does look at us like that. That is his position. And that is why he's the original father. The, the Bible is really clear. If you look at 2 Corinthians 6.18, it says, I will be a father to you. Not I am father, God. I will be a father to you. Can you see the difference? He's not saying, this is my name, just call me Father. That's just my name, like Barry or, or John or something. He's saying, I will be a father. I'm an actual father. And you shall be sons and daughters, not slaves, not um, bored people in a church going to church and some, somehow sort of talking at me. But you'll be my sons and daughters. This is in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 6, 18. And then in 1 John 30, uh, 3, verse 1, it says, See what great love we talked about with Mark's communion message, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. This is an act of love, this is a, a God desiring out of his love to, to, to father us, to, to treat us like children, not baby children, but sons and daughters. Sometimes again we can read that word children, oh he's just sort of talking down to us because we're immature and silly. No, children means child of me. It doesn't mean babyish person. It means son or daughter. He wants to treat us that way and he wants to love us that way. And lastly, he actually says, Jesus says, call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. That's challenging, isn't it? So from now on, no references to dad or father, okay? Yeah. So you just call them by the first name, that's all you're allowed to do, according to the scriptures. Now, obviously it's not actually saying that specifically. It's saying don't look at someone spiritual, spiritually as your father, as if they are taking my place. And that does happen in churches. That's why you get cults around the world. They begin to look at the person as if they're God. Oh, he's so amazing. The Pope, for example, could be unfortunately seen as so uh, superior to all human beings when they're just a human being. And they're given the attribute of being like the father. I go and speak to father so-and-so. This church is very dangerous ground, calling someone father and actually giving them that kudos as being your spiritual father. Now in the modern day church, we obviously do have people saying, oh, they're, they're, they're like a spiritual father to me. And we're careful with that word because we're not trying to say they're actually in place of God the father for me just got to be careful so just a little warning there but even in the old testament you know you think oh well this is new testament jesus has died he's paved the way for us to become sons and daughters so surely before that he was just big scary god right you know like you think old testament you think fire burning stuff people dying right you don't think loving father necessarily would you agree with me is that is that a fair statement i think that's a fair statement but here's David writing Psalm 68, I think it's David, and he says, he's talking about God, he says, you're a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, a God in his holy dwelling. So just to clarify, he's definitely talking about God. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. There's definitely a sense that be, allowing yourself to be God's son or daughter brings with it Protection, sustenance, caring, friendships, you're not lonely. But if you rebel, you're back out in the sun-scorched land on your own. It's definitely that impression. 
Isaiah 63 verse 16 says, For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us. So these guys have been in the Israelite nation for a long time. And Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. So names and words are very, very important, aren't they? The attributes we give to somebody, the authority that we give them over our lives is very, very important. And again, Isaiah says, says this, but now, O Lord, you are our Father. It's very straightforward, isn't it? He's clearly saying, you are the Father of this nation. We are like your son, and God uses that, that language. He says, my son Israel, my son Jacob. He's talking about the whole group of people. And he uses metaphorical language to say, all of you are like my son. All of you are like my daughter, my, my children. But in response, you can see the people understood that he wanted to be Father, not just God Almighty, also Father. And have we not all one Father, this is Malachi, has not one God created us? So then we get the sense then that Malachi is saying, it's God who's created every single one of us, and because of that, we belong to him. Does that mean we can act, we do automatically act like a son or daughter? No, it doesn't. Because we've just read already, just because you, God's made you, God, just because God's provided for you, you can still walk away into the sun-scorched land. You can, you can dis disappear off any time you like. And today's passage asks us this question. I mean, it's the Pharisees are talking to Jesus, aren't they? They're having a go at him, basically. They're saying, who is your father? Do you, does anyone know why? Why were they saying that about um, illegitimate birth? Did anyone know why they said that to Jesus? What was the understanding in, in the nation of Israel at the time? Anyone know? What did they think about Jesus? About his dad? That Joseph was his illegitimate dad outside of marriage or that someone else was his dad. That's what they thought. That's what they thought. Because they, they knew that they hadn't gone through with marriage and somehow she was pregnant already. And they didn't let that slip for hmm, 33 years. Can you imagine that? Yeah, but hang on. Just bringing this one up again after 30 odd years have you got people in your life like that they will not let go of the past it's tragic isn't it they're still referring to him some way that they thought they had him in the past oh we've got something on you we're going to keep hanging hanging over you the rest of your life well thankfully jesus didn't stand for it did he he took he took them on and just said you don't know what you're talking about he actually said this they asked him where is your father and he says you do not know me Sometimes we have to say, listen, guy, relative from the past, friend from the past, sorry, but you don't know me anymore. You don't know who I am in Christ now. I have a new, I'm a new person. I've walk, I'm walking with God now. I'm not who you think I am. Oh, but I know, no, you don't. You don't know me at all. You don't know me. I'm walking with Jesus now, and I'm on fire for him, and I love him. You do not know me or my father. Jesus replied, if you knew me, you would know my father also, which gives you that impression that Godly people don't hold things over people, do they? If they knew the person, they know them for who they are now. Right? And that's how we've got to treat each other. We don't go, oh, I've got to do some research. Oh, you bad ones. Oh, oh, oh that's terrible. I'll remember that. Keep bringing it up. No, we won't. Because we keep a short record. Christians keep a short record. We don't keep remembering bad stuff. We just say, oh, but three months ago, you were terrible to me. Okay, that's three months ago. Who are you today? I just love people for who they are today, this moment now. They're under mercy like we are, thank God. And he goes on to say later in the passage, if God were your father, you would love me. Not just tolerate me, you would love me. Right? And that's what we want in the church, isn't it? We want to say, if, if God's your father, like I said before, you, you know, you can't say that the church, you know, you, you, you love people, you love God, but you don't love the church, the people of God. It says, if, you, if God were your father, you would love me. And that's, not, that's the expectation we can have with each other. Well, if God's your father, love me. And I'll love you back. I'm loving you anyway. But you love me too. Come on. But I've come from God, he says. I've not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? He claimed, you, know, you, you notice that about Jesus. He always asks a question which he already, already knows the answer to. You know that? It says, he doesn't even let them speak, does he? Why is my language not clear to you? Anyway, I'll tell you the answer. Because, because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. 
So when I put that question up there, I genuinely mean it. Who is your father? Why is my language not clear to you? What is God's language like? What's it full of? Despair? Accusation? What's it sound, what's it sound like, God's language? Love. Good. Love. Hope. Forgiveness. Peace. All the good stuff. That's God's language. That's how God speaks. And then meanwhile, they're unable to hear that because they belong to their father, the devil. And notice, it's hard when you're full of mercy to think that someone belongs to the devil, but when you, when you meet enough corrupt, nasty people, you begin to suspect maybe they do. Right? Maybe they actually do enjoy serving their father, Satan. Jesus was not messing about when he said this. He's talking to Pharisees who are supposedly religious people. And he's saying, your father's the devil. I'm not looking forward to using this one, I have to tell you. It's going to be great. Next person's being a bit rude and nasty. I said, are you a Christian? No, I thought, like, your father's the devil, mate. I said, walk off. Good man. I'd be like, oh, is he? Oh. They'd probably agree. Probably go, yes, that's right. The, the thing about this thing of being a father is that the father speaks into your life. And that is one of the biggest things about a father is what they proclaim over their child. You're going to be like this. I see this in you. Fathers name their sons in the Bible. They're naming them. This is who I see in you. This is your potential. I'm going to call this out of you and I can see it even when you can't see it. Often that's the, the problem. When we don't listen to our fathers and they are godly, we miss, go off on a different tangent because we're just rebelling or whatever. But our fathers are given, are given that responsibility to call things out in us. Our future and our purpose. And this is what it says in Romans 8, 15. It says, you did not receive, this is when you became a Christian, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, dot, dot, dot. And then he goes on to talk about how you did become a Christian. And that tells us straight away that where you were before was fear-based. All of your modus operandi was based on fear. I've got to protect myself. Someone's going to take what I've got. If I don't fight for this position, I'll lose fear of missing out. We operate out of selfish ambition, pride, and all the things that are basically fear-based. Because God's not for me, I'm on my own in this world. I've got to fight to get what I want. And that's, that's the idea. But in Galatians 3 and Galatians 4, you see that Paul is talking to a, a bunch of people who've become Christians, but then they've turned back to trying to be religious again, to try and earn God's favour. Listen to this, Galatians 4. But now that you know God, so he's talking to Christians here, and I want to talk to us as Christians. Now that you know God or rather are known by God, why did Paul say that? He's saying, you've come, you've given your life to Jesus, but you don't know him as well as you should yet. But you are known by God. And that's so true with many new Christians. They, they say, I'm a Christian, they've given their life to Jesus, and to some extent they're starting to follow his purpose for their life, and, maybe, um, and then sometimes they're not, and they're taking back control. But what they're doing is they're not know and getting to know God very much. They just have one picture of God, like we sang in that song. They, they say who they think you are. Remember that song? We sang it today. And actually, they don't know who God is. How is it that you're turning back? So you can turn back to the old ways, even as a Christian. You can think, okay, well, I've given my life to Jesus. I can't pay for my sin. God's paid for me. Thank God for that. And then a little while later, things start going pear-shaped. And what happens? You revert back to the old methods. What's the old method? The way I used to think. The way I used to react. The way I used to respond. I'll just go back to doing that because God's not with me. God's let me down. I'm going to do it myself. I'll fight for myself again. It says, do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Those miserable forces. Those miserable ways of doing things. You're observing special days. He's saying, going back into religion. I'm going to go, I've got to be religious again, otherwise God won't help me. I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. This is Paul. Because Paul 
was teaching a message of grace. He was saying, being religious doesn't do anything for you, but loving God and trying to please him does bring you a relationship with the Father. And you just live for yourself, you will feel distant, you will feel a million miles away. So those who rely on faith, not works, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The contrast is this. If you're fearful, maybe you're listening to a different father. Maybe you're getting thoughts that are not coming from God, they're coming from the enemy. But if you're full of faith, most likely you're listening to the words of God and you're filling your mind and your heart with his thoughts. So God wants to be loved and trusted as our personal dad too. I like to speak on this. Because in Galatians 4, the same chapter, it says, Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, so it's the Holy Spirit, Abba, Father. Not just Father. Okay, right, I'm, I'm your son now. It's Abba, Father. Does anyone know what Abba means? Hey, Go on. Daddy, Dad. Crazy, isn't it? Like, what? What's that doing in the Bible? Can't be calling God Dad. Well, that's what it says here. He goes on in Romans 8, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Not distant, religious, scary father thing over there, but Dad. That's how God wants us to think of him. Not as father just to the nation of Israel. He was, he was exemplifying what was coming after that. With that whole relationship between him and Israel was showing us what was coming in the New Testament, which was a personal father to each of us. As Mark said earlier on, realizing that actually God's, God died for me personally. And God wants to be my personal father, my personal dad. So what does the language of a son or a daughter of God actually look like? I've gone for an Aussie one there. You like that one? No worries. That's the, I'm, I'm better when I'm not put on spot. I feel, I feel like more Australian outside of here. <laughs> no worries, no worries. That's the language we should be speaking. No worries. Zero worries. Because the Bible says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body. Is anyone managing to do that? <laughs> Sorry, but what is this raucous laughter all about? I just don't understand it. But our Father, well, let's keep reading, shall we? It says about what your your life, your what you eat or drink, about your body. Was well, anyone worrying about their body lately? Mm. Lots of prayer going on at the beginning. <laughs> what you will wear. I had to look at my son because he seems to be the major one who goes shopping in this in this church. Apart from Kate, she likes shopping as well. Um, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are you? Do we believe in the hierarchy? I believe in the hierarchy. I believe I'm slightly more valuable to God than a sparrow. Do you? Do you? Yes. Oh, good. You definitely want to get that right in theology. God's slightly more con concerned about your well-being than a sparrow. Well, there'll be other sparrows. They're nice, aren't they? Number two, there's no lack. There's no lack in our thinking. <gasps> Could have run out. Remember, even if there's not much, we are content. We don't have nothing. There's no lack. So we don't go thinking, oh, I've got nothing, I've got nothing. That's a lie. Is that true or not? Have you got nothing? Have you ever got nothing? Very, very rarely does someone have absolutely nothing. Okay? So to, to start saying I've got nothing, God's not looking after me, it's not true. Maybe I've got just enough in this season. Maybe God's just seeing me through the season until I get a job, and then I'll get the job and then I'll have more. Maybe God's seeing me through a season so I can just learn how to cope with not having much status. I don't have a real flash job anymore. Right? Maybe I don't have a car and I'm just having to ride around on a bike for a little while, but in due time, I'm going to have an Audi, uh, no, Audi TT. Audi TT. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. It's going to be a good one as well. We'll pray hard, get the right one. 
And there's no fear. The last one is there's no fear in our language. What do I mean by our language? If you are acting like a son or daughter of God, if I am acting like a son or daughter of God, my language, what does that mean? My, my speech. It is not full of worry. Oh, I just don't know how this is gonna work out. Oh, this is really bad. Oh, everything's, oh gosh, so scary. Stop it, stop it. It's unbiblical, stop it now. Get control of your mouth, decide, remember it says in that song as well, there's a great pick of songs. That it says about, I decide that I'm gonna believe what God says, effectively. And that's what Jesus was saying. You listen to the lies of the enemy, your father is the father of lies, that's what you listen to, that's why you wanna come and kill me, because you don't even know who I am. They're deceived, those Pharisees were deceived, they were listening to lies all the time, and then acting out of a place of fear, and insecurity, this bloke is going to take over everything, the Pharisees, all, all our positions are going to be null and void, oh my gosh, we've got to get rid of him. Panic, worry, anxiety, because they were listening to lies. The whole point, when people are very emotional, and very extreme, and everything's a big drama, is because they're listening to lies. A mature Christian is peaceful. They're not going whoo, bang, up and down in this emotional roller coaster. Smash down it. Ah! Oh, back up the hill. Okay, everything's okay for a bit. Ah! And then the next <laughs> right? That's not it. That's not the Christian walk. The Christian walk is mm, okay, a little bit up and down. That's all right. I'm good. I should quite enjoy it. It's fast. Right? Peace. If we haven't got peace, if we're an emotional roller coaster, we're listening to lies. Oh, this is not going to work out well. God's going to take you. God's not looking after you. You're going to get smashed. Everything. You're going to lose everything. Okay, fast forward a month. Have you lost everything? No, it's all right, actually. Oh, so what was I listening to? Lies. Fear. Lies. The devil is a liar. He gets to speak to us. And God gets to speak to us, and we get to decide, am I going to listen to that, or am I going to listen to this, my father over here? Who is my father? The one speaking the truth, Jesus was talking about the truth over and over again, the truth sets you free from the lies. Lack, you ain't going to get out of this situation, it's never going to turn, never going to change. You're going to have no money forever and ever and ever. Fast forward six months, oh, I've got a job, that's going quite well. So, was that true or not? That thing I was thinking back there six months ago, no, it was a total lie. We have to decide who we're going to listen to in those moments of uh, emotion. Emotion comes and goes. Emotions are chemical reactions. They happen in a certain circumstance. It doesn't make them right. They just go up and down. So, things that come out of our heart, out, basically out of our mouth most of the time, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you meet someone who's always panicky, is always saying, this is terrible, everything's terrible. What's in their heart? Worry and fear. We should be positive in spite of situations. We don't have to look at everything and go, that's it, I've got back into I'm never, I'm never gonna be able to play football ever again. Nathaniel. <laughs> but it's not true, is it? Because you will be playing again, you're gonna score loads of goals. Not as many as me, but you're gonna score a few. It's <laughs> gonna score a few. This week maybe, yeah, let's have more picture this week, thank you. Yes, let's go with that. Right? We get those thoughts. The devil's a liar. You know, I spent two weeks with plantar fasciitis. And Mark was stunned by this because he knows how much it hurts. In both feet, plantar fasciitis I had. And I'm thinking, oh my word, you are a... Oh. If, I could, if you were in physical being, the devil, I'd smash you to bits for doing this to me. Because the timing was, just as I'm about to play futsal, and I haven't played for 15 years, and I'm really excited, can't wait to play, suddenly I can't walk. We went to Melbourne about a month or so ago, and that's when it first happened, and I could barely walk. Massive pain under my foot, and it, and it came back just before futsal. And I'm still kind of fighting with it a bit. But the point was, I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, I feel like this is the enemy, please let, please heal me, Lord, please help me. I want to play, I want to run. I want to run and not grow weary. So I start quoting scripture. Scripture, do that to the, to the Lord. He, he loves it. It's okay. 
But you said, Lord, <laughs> your word says, that's what I do, your word says you're going to heal me. So come on. And you know what? As I'm putting on my socks and shirt trainers, my runners, I'm thinking, oh, it doesn't feel so bad now. Put my shirt trainers on. I might be able to run with that. I can't feel it as much. That's good. But I go to the sock and I say to the Lord, look, my feet are sore. I'm going to start. Out. I have to go and go off this time. But at least I'm, I'm, I'm on the pitch. So I was happy with that, but I'm on the pitch. Within about five minutes, I realised I'm not the greatest goalkeeper in the world. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to have to go out there on the pitch. Brendan, your turn. Get in the goal. And then I start running around and I think, I can actually run. This is cool. Okay, it hurts a tiny bit, but it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Fast forward a week. Last week. What happened? Team, what happened? 87. 87. <laughs> 87. And that's because my feet, I, as I got ready, I put my socks on and I put my runners on and I thought, oh my gosh, they're not hurting at all. This is crazy. I think I'm actually getting healed. And I got on the pitch and I, I think I played all right. Yeah. And, and God is a healer, but the, the lie of the enemy is, oh, this is it, and you won't be able to play football at all. You, you might as well forget it. You might as well tell you, tell you what, sign off this thing, because you ain't got a chance. There was a liar. We've got to get used to this idea. He's trying to steal from us all the time. And the last two things I'm going to point out are this. Even in our hearts, we're always judging people. Where's that coming from? Who's the accuser? Satan. Satan. He's just using you, like the Pharisees, to accuse Jesus. Stop it. Shut him down and say, okay, I don't know all the facts. I'm not going to speak that out. I might be wrong. In fact, hang on, why am I even thinking negative things about these people? Now, that's not from you, Lord, is it? Oh, I've got to stop that. Well, I'm going to show them mercy instead. Mercy is when they don't deserve it, or we think they don't deserve it. And we're also very, very aware of our own need for mercy. And the last one there is pride, self-sufficiency. That's, that's, that's fear-based, isn't it? Because God, over and over again, he says to us, lean on me, trust in me, not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Isn't it? That is a humble place. And that's the language that we want to be speaking. Okay, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know you do. Okay, Lord, I don't know what's going, how we're going to solve this, but I know you do. Thank you, Lord. And when you're trying to build a house, and there's all sorts of obstacles to it. There's a lot of temptation there to get nervous, worried, self-sufficient, all the other things. I'm personally walking this out right now. So I want us to just close in prayer and think about those things. Is there something where you've been thinking, actually, like, I'm supposed to have a father, but I keep listening to this father. Maybe we need to just say, no, he's my actual father, my dad in heaven. He loves me. He forgives me. He's full of mercy and loving kindness. I think I'll just listen to what he says. All right, let's pray along that line. Lord, I thank you, Lord, as Christians, Lord, we're born again. That means we're born into your family. And now we get to call you Dad, Abba, Father, and we get to trust you with our lives. Lord, I just thank you for Patrick, Lord, who's given his life to you recently on Dream Interpreter. Lord, I thank you that you're going to provide for him. And uh, thank you that he's listening to this message in that country where he is right now. I pray that you speak to him and you show him that you love him. And that we love him, Lord, that he's in the family of God. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for all the people in Ararat who are going to come to know you in this season. Lord, I thank you that there's going to be many people getting born again as your spirit pours out. But Lord, as a, as a church right now, I pray that, Lord, we would get into a place of discipline and, uh, Lord, discernment. Lord, where we wouldn't listen to the lies of the enemy. That we'd recognise that the devil is a liar. He cannot even tell the truth. So, Lord, help us to recognise that these things are not from you and to shut them down immediately and to say, Lord, but what do you think? What's your truth on the matter? Help us to have that mature response in Jesus' lovely name. And we love you as our dad on Father's Day. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.